Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. Alrighty, folks, today I am here with Steve Swaffer with the Noble Research Institute. And Steve is going to be joining me for a conversation about cover crop raising and why it is becoming so popular when you look at any information source, wherever you get your information, whether it's a podcast newsletter or still print publication. And he's going to cover the advantages of using cover crop grazing, um, implementing that into your grazing strategies, really. How you as ranchers, if you don't have your own farm ground, can work with maybe neighbors who are farming, as well as how cover crop grazing can be beneficial in different environments, whether you are arid or too wet or somewhere in between. So with that, Steve, before we dive into the subject itself, I'd like to hear a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and how you got to where you are today. I um, I grew up in Tulsa, but um, our family farms were about two hours to the west, and I spent good majority of the nicer weekends during the year uh, at the farm and the entire summer at the farm. Uh, we were primarily certified wheat seed growers and registered Angus cattle. Uh, and the herd really uh, focused on show cattle. Uh, so it was a pretty small closed herd. Um, but uh, when heifers were born or, and steers were, were born, the call started because they showed pretty well. Uh, yeah. So that's that's my background in agriculture. But um, I've been working in agriculture for the last 25 years. Uh, I started um, working for the state of Kansas in their Department of Health and Environment, but that involved working with uh, farmers and ranchers. Um, but I went to work for the Kansas Farm Bureau uh, for 13 years prior to uh, leaving that. Um, and I, I, I worked in the Natural Resources uh, Division as well as the Public Policy Government Relations Division. At, at the end, I was running both of those shops Um I went to No-Till on the Plains from there, which was a a home-based business nonprofit that was a soil health educational association. So that's really where my soil health and cover crops exposure began um, in earnest. Um, And then I left there and and have been with the Noble Research Institute just a little bit over two years now. So that's kind of the history of Steve in agriculture anyway. All right. Well, Steve, I appreciate you going into your background there. And with that, I think we'll dive right into the point of conversation then with cover crops and what it means for cow-calf producers, how it can be beneficial to them. Okay, Steve, so our point of conversation today is cover crop grazing, because for my listeners out there, the whole month of April is really going to be focused on kind of regenerative practices, soil health, um, everything related to regenerative agriculture really in the ranching space. And so with this cover crop discussion, like we were talking about before um, I hit record, cover crops aren't new. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a new conversation. They've been around for a long time, but they're really picking up a lot of traction. They're getting a lot of headlines. People are noticing them more and maybe they're coming back in another wave is another Mm -hmm. way to look at it. And so can you talk a little bit why there's this increasing, there are these increasing conversations about cover crops in the cow-calf space? Sure. Well, uh, you, you really can't open up an agricultural publication these days without seeing an article on soil health. And soil health is what drives the discussion around cover crops. Uh, and just as the word says, it's a, it's a tool to keep the soil covered. 
Um, it's a it's a tool to add diversity uh, to your soil, but for the livestock producer, it's also a, an appealing uh, forage source, and so we see a pretty good opportunity for marriage uh, between the pure farmer and the pure rancher, and 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 that overlap. Um, but the you know the the point you made earlier, Shay, about this being not new, uh, I remember my grandfather referring to the cover crops as green manure uh, when he was a, a young man or uh, still working on their farm. And this is prior to the, you know, availability of commercial fertilizers widely after World War II. And so, yes, indeed, this isn't new. Um, and and the value that, that a rancher can find from cover crops for forage is, is probably something that they really need to explore, particularly if they have nutritional uh, deficiencies at a certain time of the year, or they just lack forage during a certain time of the year. So with this cover crop discussion, are you seeing more popularity in certain regions of the country compared to others just because growing seasons can vary so differently depending on where cow-calf producers are located? Yeah, sure. Any place that we have abundant moisture, it's going to be a lot easier sell for a cover crop. Um, they, they may even be utilized in some cases to, get, to take moisture out of the soil. Um, but it's really a much easier decision to make when you know going into that that planting time frame you've got adequate uh, resident soil moisture your expectation is going to be there that you're going to have soil moisture coming to to supply that crop as well um, and then also that you've got a long enough growing season ahead of you that you're going to be able to get some benefit out of that cover crop so as we move you know into the arid and semi-arid parts of, of the, the country, it's a lot more difficult decision to, to invest in the seed uh, for a cover crop. You may look at um, scaling back the number of species to save a, a little bit on those seed costs. The value of the cover doesn't change across the country. Keeping that soil covered, keeping something growing in the soil doesn't change where you are across the country how you get there to get the soil covered and, and the tools that you use are clearly different from one part of the country to another. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. Well, thank you for explaining that and that um, I was going to ask you, you know, where producers still finding that value, but thank you for also diving into that no matter where you are, offering that extra soil cover matters and is valuable. Yeah. So for people who aren't as familiar with cover crops, can you explain a little bit about how producers are working cover crops into their grazing rotations. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think that with any cover crop or any management decision, having a goal in mind uh, is really important. So if you're uh, about to make a decision of whether to have or not have a cover crop, uh, starting with that goal in mind is, is really the, the, the important step uh, to, to making a, a, a well-informed decision. So for, for the average cow-calf guy, it may be I want to reduce the amount of f f hay that I have to feed in any given year. So wherever that, that deficiency in forage occurs, is there an opportunity for a cover crop to fill that void at an equivalent or lesser price? Or is it offering a higher value uh, forage at that time when I need it? And so those are the, the, the goals that one might want to set in order to make the decision about cover crops. Then it's a, it's a matter of uh, determining what the return on your investment is going to be. So as a, as a producer who's looking to fill that forage hole, uh, I need to invest 
20 to $30 per acre in seed, and then uh, the fuel to that it takes to put that seed in the ground. And then at the end of that, how much forage can I have an expectation of pounds per acre, animal unit days, whatever is the, the, uh, the, the value that they use on their operation. And does it now extend my grazing season? Does it reduce the need for me to buy hay either in the winter or in the in the hotter parts of the the uh, country in the summertime we're feeding hay because we're out of forage so I, I think those are the the two things that if you've not ever used a cover crop you need to be thinking about okay how how can I use it most efficiently and then the frame of mind is that that's a cover crop so it it must have a dual benefit if the idea is you're going to put something in there strictly as forage let's not cover it. let's not call it a cover crop um, cover crop means you're going to leave some residue behind so that that soil is is protected and so producers need to factor that in if indeed their goal is to have soil benefit as well as forage benefit and so that's a management decision they just need to make is there any impact on animal performance when people are looking at maybe some rotational grazing strategies and implementing cover crops in there that producers need to be aware of, you know, thinking about the goal of the producer mm. and how they're trying to market their cattle. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you got a, a, a highly uh, energetic forage, like a, a newly growing cover crop is going to be full of carbohydrates and, and you're going to have to balance that that diet out for your animals. And so offering them either um, mineral and dry matter is probably going to be really important part of that grazing strategy. The animal, given the opportunity to have the resources, will balance it out for themselves. But it, it is a it is something that folks need to be aware of. There are certain species at certain growth stages that they need to be aware of. I, the one that comes to mind is if you have a sorghum in your mix and, and you get a freeze, then you're going to have prussic acid in that sorghum for a couple of weeks. And, you know, you need to manage those types of issues. Um, but really, it, it's it's understanding that it, it's a it's still an animal diet balance that you're trying to create. Um, and if you're looking for a finishing ration, this may be one of those perfect opportunities to finish animals on because it is going to be such high in carbohydrates. Okay. So when producers are maybe in the first one to five years of implementing cover crops, whether they're growing them themselves or um, grazing on a neighbor's um, field maybe who's planting cover crops for their own purposes. What are some of those initial growing pains or maybe mistakes that they're working through? Yeah, I, I think um, ensuring that your cover crop has been able to establish well it is one of the very first things that they need to understand. Um, you know, a blade of grass that's three, two to three inches tall, probably really not ready to be grazed yet. I mean, we do that uh, a fair amount with small grains already, but a cover crop is trying to establish a full root system so that it is protecting the soil, keeping that soil in place, in addition to feeding the microbial community through those root sugars that are released. And so ensuring that you've got a good solid growth before you ever put animals out there is probably number one rule. Um, understanding how much is out there. Uh, so either uh, with a visual uh, assessment or even a, a measurement, a clip and weigh method or grazing stick, but knowing, you know, this is the amount of forage that I have out here and the expectations that I can have of that forage, making sure that you're balancing the amount of uh forage that you're going to provide to the animal versus saving it back for the residual to protect the soil. And in that same process of uh, determining how much forage you have, how frequently are you needing to move animals in order to leave that that residual behind? And so uh, if, if folks are not used to moving animals frequently, that may be something they have to get themselves accustomed to. Uh, so setting up bigger paddocks uh, to begin with so that it's not 
uh, as burdensome for them initially. Uh, and then as they begin to observe the grazing patterns on those cover crops, they can uh, reassess and maybe make some adjustments in that, okay, I, I can actually be out here every second day as opposed to every day or every third day, however that works best for them. But, you know, kind of understanding what their own limitations, what their own capabilities are, is going to be a big part of that. Because if they move the animals um, not frequently enough, they've essentially uh, taken away the dual benefit of a cover crop. If it's grazed right down to the soil level, there's no cover left. And so again, it becomes a forage crop, not a cover crop. Okay. So the next maybe question or point of discussion I want to bring up is not all ranchers are farmers as well or growing their own feed. I know a lot of people who do both, but mm -hmm. not everyone does. So how can farmers and ranchers work together to introduce cover crops in a way where it's going to be mutually beneficial and profitable for both parties? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Shay. Um, we, we have in agriculture, we have kind of separated these enterprises and that we farm and, and we ranch and we, we, do less overlap than we did in our past and and animal integration onto farm ground and as one of the soil health principles so we want animals to be integrated onto our farm ground leaving manures leaving uh, urine uh, grazing um, salivary action those kinds of things and so from a farmer standpoint they get the benefit to their soil uh, so they've got that more free manure that's coming out. Um, they've got uh, the urine. And, and then the hoof action is also a, a positive benefit for that for that uh, crop producer. Now he's got a different way to perhaps manage those cover crops where he may have one less trip across the field. He doesn't have to either roll them down or he doesn't have to spray them because he can he can control the growth stages with the animals. And so he's got that that potential savings of on a management activity and then a grazing lease. Uh, he's got a he's got an economic opportunity there. Well for the rancher side, it, it's again looking at what his forage uh, deficiency times might be. Do I have an opportunity with somebody close by where I can take some pressure off of my grasses and, and move them onto a, of a, a cover crop for a, a, an alternative forage? Um, do I have some animals that I want to uh, finish in a particular manner and I could contract with a farmer to, to develop a particular cover crop that has a finishing forage in it? And so right before I'm going to the sale barn, I, I can put animals out there. And, and again, it gives that rancher that opportunity to maybe take a, some pressure off of uh, their existing forages, maybe relieves the need to to buy as much hay during the year. Uh, if their goal is to keep the, the animals grazing as many days during the year as possible, then, then that's just another way that they can spread the grazing out throughout the season. So for producers who have never done this before and they want to create a grazing plan and start implementing cover crops, what questions do they need to be asking themselves or maybe what are those initial steps that lead up to setting themselves up for success? Yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing is if you can find a mentor who's already done it or you can uh, get education uh, about it, there are folks out there Um I, I don't know of any of the plain states that wouldn't have mm -hmm. somebody that has has done this uh, to a pretty wide extent. Um, and then start small. Um, please learn uh, and experiment a little bit. This is too valuable for you to, to make a wholesale change in your grazing plan based on something you don't have experience with. And so I would encourage folks to use pieces of their own property to experiment with. So if you have some 
introduced forage pastures. These are great places where you can uh, maybe intercede a cover crop into that existing forage and, and see how it responds, or if you just have farm ground. But um, uh, learn from uh, your experiences, observe how the plants grow, observe how the animals uh, will graze this area. If your animals have never been in a green cover crop, uh, it's probably going to be important for you to watch how they graze. Uh, they're going to have species preferences. They're going to go after certain things first. Um, they're going to, they're probably going to need uh, some differences in distances to water or to dry matter or to mineral. These are all things that, that are going to be important for that first time cover crop uh, grazer to learn about. And so there's lots of opportunities to learn about that, both electronically, in person. Uh, Noble Research Institute has several courses uh, coming up this year uh, on grazing that we'll talk about cover crops as well. So learn first. All right. So with that, you just mentioned a few resources um, on the Noble side. Are there any other resources that you want to share or talk about today? Yeah, I, I would encourage folks to, to look at um, folks that are experienced with this kind of grazing. Jim Garrish is one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, the, un, the guys with Understanding Ag are also experienced with these, these types of, of grazing systems. But um, um, look for uh, resources online. Um, Integrity Soils is one that immediately comes to mind. But there, there are lots of, of resources out there. Noble, obviously, is somebody we want folks to, to come to and rely on as, as a resource. We have our essentials of, of uh, grazing uh, being already uh, out there this year. Our land essentials course is, is already out there this year that will, can teach folks about the soil health principles, ecosystem processes, and adaptive grazing. And then for folks that are already into the system, we'll have a more business of grazing course coming up later in the year. All right. Well, Steve, before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share with those listening? Yeah, I, I would really encourage those that that are considering cover crops, even if you're in a more harsh environment where it, it's really questionable in your mind that that I can get some benefit from a cover crop to to utilize and to explore those opportunities where it might be beneficial so not every year you're going to be blessed with uh, ample rains but in a year that you do have a little extra this is the the opportunity that you want to be ready for uh, and, and go ahead and have a plan so maybe a little seed sitting in the shed you know exactly where you're going to put that seed once that once that opportunity comes out but 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 be ready for it um, know what what you're going to do um, and learn 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 you know um i might i might just mention real quickly uh, that a cover crop is a crop and it kind of needs to be viewed that way. And, and so some cover crops, depending on what the mix of species is, do uh, perhaps need a little shot of starter fertilizer. Um, and that investment that you may make into that starter fertilizer for that cover crop uh, may make the difference in the ability to get some really good grazing out of it. And so uh, just like a, a, a cash crop, if your expectation is a, is a payoff at the end, you need to be thinking about the investment that you need to make up front. And, and I think there are certain soils, certain cover crop mix is where that's a very appropriate management tool. Alrighty, folks, thank you for taking time out of your day and spending it with me on the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast. I was excited to bring this topic to you. If you have more questions about cover crop grazing, any grazing or regenerative practices, be sure to check out the link to Noble in my show notes. There's a lot of great resources on there. I get their newsletter. It's a um, great informational piece as well. And so with that, be sure to check out those resources and have a great rest of your day.